How we want to present this today is um, very much about the role that Transforming Timber, the project itself, is, is, is playing a, a pivotal piece in a much broader spectrum of, of work, uh, which is now incorporating NMI as, as part of that, and also, by extension, a, a, a partnership which is involved with uh, Timber Development UK, which aligns in, in many respects with, with what Andy is saying, because ultimately, what we're trying to do here is add value to the local Scottish UK timber resource and maximise that value return by putting it into the, the built environment and creating a carbon, a carbon sink. Uh, but it's part of a, a broader spectrum uh, in terms of, you know, it's always going to be a very much a sort of blended approach. And it's really about how we maximise the utilisation of wood fibre for the, the delivery of the built environment. So we know, um, and this has probably been touched upon today, but we know that the UK is, also, is already one of the largest global importers of, of timber resource. And as I say, what we want to do is, is maximise the use of our local resource within that, uh, within that picture in order that we can lock the carbon in for, for longer. So it's not going to fences, pallet packaging or paper as, as first point of call because ultimately that returns carbon back into the atmosphere uh, too quickly. Um, what we want to do is use it for construction purposes. In terms of construction um, within the, you know, the UK, uh, the, the, sort of the major, one of the dominant forms of timber construction is timber platform frame. Uh, we're in Scotland, of course. Uh, at, at present, and timber platform frame construction, uh, and if you saw the, the presentation from Stuart Milne Timber Systems earlier, um, is a predominant form of, t of timber construction, uh, or new build uh, residential construction uh, within, within Scotland, uh, in about you know, 83 to 85%. Uh, and that averages out UK-wide uh, at 30%, right? So there's a huge market opportunity uh, within that, uh, as, as that you know, the opportunity for, for growth in terms of uh, housing, housing delivery. Um, one thing to note in there again is um, the new build market, the need for affordable housing delivery uh, and current sort of uh, necessity for that and, UK, and government targets of about 300,000 uh, houses uh, per annum. Uh, however, that's nowhere near being met, uh, being met and indeed the, uh, the, the pandemic, uh, you know, also put that on a, a, a further sort of downward, downward turn so that the, the housing delivery wasn't uh, being reached. So as a result, there's, there's going to be, you know, quite a, a positive upturn, we would suspect, in, in that area. Uh, and indeed, a, a lot of the, the major house developers are now moving away from the traditional forms and looking at, uh, you know, the utilisation of timber and timber platform frame construction. The, the, obviously, the emphasis of what we've been doing in timber, uh, transforming timber is around uh, uh, mass timber systems, uh, and not just cross lamb, uh, the, the bonded products in, in terms of CLT and glue lamb, but also in terms of neo laminated timber and dual laminated timber. Um, so, mass timber in the round. And that's, that's as Andy kind of alluded to in, the, in the, his presentation, is drawn upon a his, historic research base uh, from. Edinburgh Napier University. So we've come quite a considerable journey indeed from when we put a, a veneer press in an organic farm outside of, <laughs> outside of Inverness uh, to, to, the, to the point now where the, with the Innovation Centre uh, with the vacuum press and what that, what that can do. So what we want to do is obviously mobilise mass timber construction so we can, we can add value to the resource. And kind of what's interesting is the tensions that are taking play in, in, that, in, in the market at the moment in many respects. So you have this uh, government drive towards net zero carbon, um, you know, the, the need to deliver the built environment more sustainably, which then uh, focuses in on in timber as a, a mode of delivering that. But, you know, recently in, in London, it's been announced, you know, in many respects, a, a sort of ban on the use of combustible materials for, for uh, residential delivery. So there's this tension that's taken place and we need to overcome uh, much, of that, much of these tensions and indeed use the information that's available to us to demonstrate how safe, durable, uh, you know, producing the built environment from timber is. Uh, you know, at one point in Hackney, Murray Grove, and Andrew Wall no doubt touched upon it earlier, was the tallest timber building uh, in, in the world using that form of construction. So the UK was trailblazing in that respect, innovative the innovative use of mass timber. 
Uh, that's since been well superseded in Mjostranet in Norway, up at 18 storeys, uh, has, has topped out. Well, so it's like, you know, around the world, we're seeing the commercialisation of, of mass timber uh, taking place, and we're also seeing tall timber buildings and uh, other forms of other forms of, of delivery. But the, the, in, in some respects, the UK has has taken a reverse gear, and actually, what we need to do is dispel some of the myths around this, using the work that's gone before in this country, as well as what's taken place uh, internationally. Um, so that's really about how we overcome things like the, the perceptions of utilising timber from a durability or, or fire performance uh, standpoint uh, and, and call upon the, the research innovation work that, that's taken place. And, and in that respect, the UK does have a long heritage of timber construction, you know, which dates back to the likes of, you know, crook frames, etc. And even when we, you know, shipped, uh, you know, the Manning Cottage to, to Australia. So we have a rich heritage and we need to call upon that and use it in order to, to move, move forward. Um, COP26, of course, uh, the Sustainable Development Goals, um, of which there's, there's too many to, to actually remember. So just taking it in a, in a simple perspective and how we have to think about things differently. And one of the things that we used within the Transforming Timber project application, indeed, was around um, how to think, uh, think about this differently in terms of delivery using this sort of five capitals model approach. So thinking about how we can maximise the use of our renewable natural capital, what that can do in terms of social capital, so that sort of biophilic design uh, approach, say, even in terms of so social well-being. Um, what does this mean in terms of uh, human capital and, and skills and culture? And indeed, uh, what this all plays out in terms of economic delivery and, and financial capital obviously has its, its place to play in terms of uh, commercialisation. Uh, and of course, manufacturing capital and how we can take more industrialised approaches. So timber obviously has a, a huge part to play in that. It is a natural renewable capital as long as we have good uh, forestry management practices. Ultimately, we spend 80 to 90 percent of our time in the built environment, uh, so it's important to, to deliver it uh, using the appropriate approaches for health and well-being. We need to uh, educate. We need people to understand what buildings and construction do in terms of carbon impact. Um, and not just um, the, the wider public, but even within our, our university bases where even you know, in civil engineering, steel and concrete are the primary materials that are taught. So we, we primarily teach the carbon intensive methods of construction for built environment delivery. And fundamentally, we, we need to absolutely uh, change that. And as I say, from a sort of financial uh, perspective and an economic driver, we need to maximise value return. But we also have to think completely differently about this in terms of business model and procurement approaches. Uh, so we don't think about just capital upfront cost, we have to think about whole life cost and indeed within that, the environmental impact of, of what we're doing. So timber in construction has a, a huge part to play in this. Uh, obviously, as the tree grows, it locks in carbon, maximising the value return of that within the built environment has a huge part to play. But equally, we have to think about the fabric performance uh, and in, te in terms of it being energy, you know, energy performance uh, and, and therefore reducing the, the carbon consumption uh, from, from those that are, that are utilising utilizing the building. And timber can absolutely respond to that. But we, we have to think of, of this also, and as, you know, this is a, a, a piece of work that was published in the, the I struck T, uh, so that we do things in a productive manner. Um, we have this piece around construction in terms of how construction uh, productivity is stagnated at best, and we need to accelerate that, the, the level of productivity, particularly around things like the housing need. But if we accelerate productivity using uh, carbon-intensive materials, then all we do is accelerate the, the, the climate crisis. So we have to obviously use uh, timber or naturally occurring materials for that delivery. But within that, we have to think about maximising the value return. We have to think about circularity, so retaining the, the value of it. And we have to think about it all the way to end of life, uh, such that if it, at the very end of its life, it's perhaps using for uh, woody biomass and for fuel, and to that end, even think about carbon capture and storage. So we look, we are thinking completely about how we can decarbonise that that value chain. Factory-based approaches. We're in the innovation factory. There've, there's been, a, you know, a considerable investment in here, uh, and that, that's really about how we can use timber for the delivery of the built environment, but use it using, uh, or do it using. Sort of, uh, a factory or a, a manufacturing 
uh, thought process. So, uh, you know, using a lean thinking and thinking about things in terms of how you can do them more productively uh, in order to, to uh, reduce waste. And that's not just about full volumetric turnkey solutions. That goes all, you know, it goes to that end. But equally, we have to think about, uh, you know, uh, precision engineered sub-assemblies or even pop-up factories on, on site. Uh, so th things like the, the WikiHouse system uh, and, and facet homes. So you have to think about the, the broad, set, broad spectrum of factory-based approaches that we can use for delivery uh, and the various products that res reside within that. So in that regard, there is a, a vast array of timber products and, and solutions, and we have to think about this with respect to it being a, a product family uh, architecture and, and correspondingly how you can use that product family architecture and the digitization of it in order to respond to the, the given context uh, most optimally. So these are the, 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 sort of the, the, the new approaches and the, and the new mindsets that we need to introduce into the, the educational system. And with respect to that, obviously a, a big piece that has to play uh, in this regard is, of course, you know, Industry 4.0 and digitization. And that's not just thinking about building information modeling, right? That's thinking about forest, in forest information management. It's then thinking about when it goes into the, the production process, it's thinking about enterprise resource planning, it's thinking about computer-aided design and corresponding computer-aided manufacture, and, there, and then moving that forward into the actual built environment uh, and the, the, the virtual building itself in terms of digital twin. And where you want to be with that is then creating a feedback loop from that uh, virtual asset, or from that actual asset to the virtual asset so that you can look at the predicted performance versus the actual performance. And ideally, you have traceability of that all the way back to the, the forest floor so you can understand the full carbon credentials of, of what you've done. And there's a whole piece in there in terms of the interoperability of the, the systems and the traceability of all of that so that you can have true transparency in what you've done. But equally from that feedback loop point of view by embedding sensors, et cetera, within the building itself, then you can get a full understanding of, of how it's performing acoustically, structurally, thermally, even the health and well-being of the occupants. And that fundamentally helps us continue to optimize what we're, what we're doing and ideally future-proof uh, as we go forward, particularly given uh, you know, the climate agenda. So why aren't we doing more of this? <clears throat> well, there's real challenges and barriers at play. Um, we're dealing with a very uh, complex uh, landscape in terms of construction delivery. And as I say, we have to think about from the forest floor all the way through to the built asset. As you move through the sawmill, and then you look to add value to, those pro to that dimensional, dimensional timber. So you're using equipment, you're using adhesives, you're using fixings, you're adding insulation to it. Uh, you're there, and then you're incorporating uh, mechanical, electrical uh, into, into the end building system, right? And within that, you've, you've got the engineered timber products that you're making from the dimensional timber or the oriented strand board or the structural composite lumber or whatever it may be. Uh, and then you're moving that forward into that end built system and from a full, uh, to the full fabric of that uh, building envelope and ideally having it or, you know, highly energy performing. And within that, you've got the client who's making decisions. You've got that sort of traditional business model and procurement approach. You've got the main contractor who then subcontracts, and you have architects, engineers, cost consultants, uh, you know, building performance engineers, et cetera, all in the mix of that, right? And then you have those that influence that, uh, that full uh, sort of supply chain uh, and landscape also in terms of going from your, your investors all the way through to your warranty providers and insurers. So it's very complex, and that's the landscape of what we need to educate uh, and upskill and reskill in order that we can, we can make the shift that we need in terms of using more timber uh, within, within construction. And as I say, that human capital piece and skills and culture are absolutely key to this. Uh, the sort of recent stats from the, the CITB saying that we need 350,000 full-time employee, employees within the next decade to, to hit net zero carbon targets, right? Uh, and that's not including the reskilling and upskilling of those that are already within the system, never mind the general public and indeed the politicians, right? So there's a, there's a huge piece to play. And when we go out and speak to the industry uh, and others, what they're, what they're really saying to us now is it needs a change of approach, it needs a change of understanding, and what we need to develop is more holistic knowledge sets 
within the individuals and ultimately create a more collaborative culture towards construction uh, delivery. So we all know the sort of farmer modernise or, or, or die piece, right? Um, but ultimately, you know, uh, if we don't modernise, uh, construction will, will die. Well, that was what written uh, more than five years ago, and we still, we're still trying to, to tackle that. Um, so with regards to sort of the, the BioSM sort of uh, accelerator piece, uh, I don't think that animation is fully working, but we'll not worry about it too much. Well, what we've been trying to do, I don't know if you've ever heard of this, a quadruple helix model. Uh, it's a kind of take on that. We were trying to bring together education, research, um, sorry, research, innovation, commercialization, and education, and bring that together uh, so that it's got a much more symbiotic relationship so that we can affect change at scale and create the, the right level of collaboration and do that through network effect also by working with the, the trade organizations and trade or, uh, associations so that we can get information out there and also work with, the, with customers and early adopters in terms of how we instigate the, um, the value chain and, and value add towards something that we're calling the living lab. So if we take this, essentially what this says is if we take this sort of five capitals model approach, right, and you look at the convergence of the, the drivers that are within that, then it ultimately means that for the delivery of the built environment, you have to use more natural renewable capital. And if you look at the key drivers within construction and what needs to change, then if you take sustainability, culture, productivity, digitization, uh, and skills and the regulatory drivers and the convergence of those, then it essentially leads you down a factory-based approach. So that, by default, therefore, means that you have to use renewable natural capital and timber through a factory-based approach for, uh, for the delivery of the built environment and construction. And then the living lab piece is about th those living labs are essentially the built environment becoming the lab in itself where you have a feedback loop from it into the digital model so you can get that, that holistic understanding. So in terms of this, um, what, we've ha what we have in front of us is what's called a mega map, or that's what we've called it, uh, where we've looked at essentially the range of projects that we have underway uh, via the, sort of the, the partners involved in this, right? We have this sort of PhD research work that's been ongoing at Edinburgh Napier and how it's underpinning uh, the information that we've used uh, within the, the projects that we're now seeing live through the sort of commercial acceleration piece, working with the likes of, of, of MAP. And then we have the, the wood fiber uh, built environment, or wood fiber rich built environment work, which Andy Leach has spoke of. And then we have transforming timber, which is a sort of innovation piece. So if we think about that landscape and what you need to do to unlock it, to get the, the policy change, the regulatory change, what innovation do you need within that landscape to unlock that change? And then how do you cross that chasm to getting this stuff commercialized so it actually takes, takes place within the market? We then have to think about that educational piece and in that regard, what we need to do via timber technology, engine, design from an upskilling perspective. And ultimately, uh, what I'm currently working on uh, through the to establish the Centre for Advanced Timber Technology as part of this uh, collaborative landscape. So just to get, give a feel for it, we have, a, a, you know, we have five PhD uh, PCs currently mobilised at Edinburgh Napier. Uh, looking at things such as design for manufacturing assembly, disassembly, and reutilization, how you can collect data from uh, the, the virtual assets and look at the data flows and dashboard and all of that to make that information more transparent. And then even things from a technical perspective, uh, as you look at uh, engineered products and how you can, uh, if, you're, if you're stretching the limitations of those and moving out with some of the boundary conditions, what does that mean in terms of the structural performance criteria, in terms of not just the ultimate limit state, but the service li serviceability limit state, uh, and what that means in terms of dynamic, dynamic response. And of course, that's the sort of underpinning research through the PhD studentships, but then we also move that forward and use much of that talent to map into the, the industry requirements. We've touched upon the mass timber research work that we've been doing, and that's not just technical, it's looking at market, uh, looking at the, the market piece to understand some of the, the, the commercial requirements so that we can ultimately uh, em, embed that in what we're doing and be able to respond to it. And, and also looking at things like the homegrown uh, demonstrator, so how we can collect information, build it into digital models, and see what impact uh, it has in terms of using more uh, UK-based resource 
uh, within these built systems. And also, what's good about the digital piece is look at what that means in terms of scalability. So you can do it for one house, but what if you do it for 150, 300, or 3,000, and what impact that would have? And equally, that, what carbon impact that would have, but also, what does that mean in terms of what you need to do from a manufacturing or production perspective? So Matt's been waiting very patiently by my side to talk about transforming timber. <laughs> and, and that's where we're moving on to next as, as part of this, this landscape. Uh, because Mark, Matt and his team's hard work and effort over the last number of weeks, the assets are actually uh, behind us. So what I'll do is I'll hand to Matt now to explain some of the sort of innovation and commercialization approaches that have been taking place and perhaps explain some of the, the products and systems that we can, we can see. Sure. Matt. Th thanks, Robert. Um, yeah, I, th I think we can all agree on the points that R Robert's uh, gone through there, the, you know, the drivers, the reasons to do stuff. But how do you actually unlock that? How do you get that from, you know, really compelling concept to actually something deliverable and something that can, on the back of that, be commercialized? Um, and within that uh, graphic which Robert showed, um, there's the commercial accelerator role, which, which uh, as ecosystems technologies, we adopt. So what that entails is, you know, actually grabbing, grabbing the, 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 the concept and running with it, trying to get the really rich uh, research and development uh, and catalyze that through delivering it into live projects. Um, so I can walk, walk, uh, walk us through some uh, the journey that we've been on really since the end of last year. It's uh, um, in November, December last year, uh, we manufactured the, uh, the structural shell of the uh, Synergy demonstrator, the transforming timber demonstrator, which is behind us there. Um, so uh, the, uh, the, 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 the demonstrator is a two-bed duplex. For Synergy, who you should visit and uh, find out more about the uh, the, um, the new way of living that uh, can be provided through through the work that Synergy are doing and the transformative impact that they can have on uh, on energy systems and community energy uh, approach. Um, when we when we delivered the uh, that that dem demonstrator, we chose not just to go for the production of cross laminated timber as an output. Not that that wouldn't have been ambitious enough, but this, this is a piece of project work is about actually setting our goals beyond just the, 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 the sort of immediate uh, deliverables to what the long-term implications can be for biogenic off-site manufacturing. So the, the unit that you can see uh, has cross-laminated timber walls, glue-laminated timber floors, nail-laminated timber roof, uh, ceilings and roof panels. Um, and the nail lamb uses lignolock nails, which is a beach nail, so it's you know, genuinely uh, uh, you know, wood-first approach, albeit it's imported beach, I'm afraid, so uh, we made a small concession there. Um, the, uh, and, and in the build-up uh, beyond that as well, we're looking at you know, how, how can we make sure that the remainder of the external fabric is, is, uh, is uh, wood fibre rich. So, uh, the, the wood fiber e external insulation uh, is, uh, is, is, is relatively known and, and tri trialed. We've been using that for years, but in the roof construction, we've got uh, a combination of 120 mil of wood fiber insulation topped with 125, 120 mil of cork, and that's allowed us to, uh, to have a, an, a, 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 war, a warm roof build-up. So immediately onto that, we have a TPO single ply roof membrane. This is a system developed by Suprema, and this is the first time it's used in the UK. We've actually got a project on site already for Fetis College, which deploys that. And Scott, who's doing his PhD in digital twin, twinning and, uh, sen dig and censoring, uh, has got sensors already applied within that, that construction. So we can start to really early monitor and see how performance on, on site and in situ relates to the actual design performance. And typically, we've, uh, we, uh, we tend to get better results uh, in use than in design, which is rare, of course, uh, in construction industry, but can be expected with uh, an off-site approach. Um, so that gave us a really early platform to say, we can dry the homegrown resource down to 12% moisture content. And that can be done at commercial scale. So BSW Timber have done a phenomenal uh, job of demonstrating that that can 
be done without loss of yield. Uh, Dave Mills and his team at uh, Boater Garden have brought real expertise in timber drying to, to de demonstrate that. So on the basis of that, you know, we can look at this being a genuine commercial uh, proposition. So roll forwards, you know, the, the other projects which we have uh, on, uh, exhibited here, we've got the near home solution. So uh, Transport Scotland, uh, funded by a Scottish government and provided that funding to Construction Scotland Innovation Centre to, to deliver a near-to-home working solution. So we picked up uh, the opportunity to be lead designer on that and deploy some of the timber innovation that we've done on the Synergy Demonstrator into that. So we developed a glue laminated timber portal that uh, is a very efficient use of, uh, it's like a hybrid between cross lam and glue laminated timber solution. And uh, Andrew Livingston and his team at Napier uh, took that round with it and we've created computational mathematics that, uh, that means that we've got a, 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 a uh, we can, we can uh, have a configuration tool which allows us to deliver to various solutions. I'm conscious of time, so I'm going to try and rattle through uh, more than I'm doing so far. But that we've now sort of taken that and run with it, and we have a, a design tool, an app that can can be used as an, on an open source basis, so that individuals can design their own system, and that can immediately uh, be be done through a um, uh, through a configuration tool. So. Actually, this, this allows for the scale. It allows for that to be scaled beyond, you know, individuals having to do the design piece. So uh, take a look at that. Take a look at the app and, uh, and hopefully you'll en enjoy seeing that. Uh, and then as a, as a massive crescendo in the run-up to, uh, to this event, uh, we've, we've been uh, fortunate enough to deliver the, uh, the Gen Zero uh, schools prototype. And that's working with UK government's Department for Education. And that is a really exciting prospect because it, this project is about more than creating commodities. It's about creating solutions. It's about creating systems. And it's, created, and it's bringing those together in a way that then can be rolled out at scale but with, with meaning and purpose. And, you know, we, need, we, have, we have all those ingredients of the technical capability, the, the natural resource, um, and deploying that in a project like the Gen Zero project is, you know, phenomenally exciting. Um, to see that come together and to see the massive uh, mass timber sections uh, become a reality and to see, it was great to see Sam's presentation earlier that sort of overlaid the actual uh, built unit against the, uh, the concept is uh, just phenomenally exciting. So we, uh, we, we think we're in rude health to push forward from this. So. Uh, Robert, better take the mic back, because otherwise I'll keep talking. <laughs> that's okay. Yeah, yeah, I'm known for that myself right now, so mm -hmm. that's okay. Um, so, yeah, I think one of the really interesting pieces around this is if we were simply doing our research in isolation and not engaging with, with likes of what Matt's doing at Ecosystems and, and having the interventions from, from the Construction Scotland Innovation Centre uh, and, and also thinking about this from an educational standpoint, if we were looking at those things in isolation, th then we wouldn't get the, the scale of the impact that we need. So it's, it's really about the, the isolated parts coming together in, in combination or in concert to affect change at, at scale. And, and, you know, that was a slide from our original sort of pitch presentation and things have moved on since then. But essentially what we were looking at was, you know, as I say, how we can take the work that we're doing, embed it into the digital models, but equally have a, a series of lies, live assets uh, that come into reality. And from those live assets, um, I, I don't, as those projects become live, take the measurements and monitor, and monitor the situation as much as possible and capture that into the digital model so that we can look to uh, further optimization. And equally, uh, create the information so that you can, you can make a more discernible uh, business case, right? And you can, in, you can inform that judgment. Uh, so, so in that point of view, it's, it's not just about uh, it cost X, because part, part of the issue sometimes is, well, you know, is timber, can timber compete on cost? And it's like, well, what's the cost of our children not having a future, right? So it's about saying, what is the actual cost that we need to consider in making that information as transparent as possible? So it may cost more, but ultimately, its whole life cost is, is far better. Or it may cost the same, or it may cost cheaper if you get the right level of optimization. 
but it's how you collate that information and present it in a, in a manner where you can affect uh, the decision-making process. So that's why the, the, the living lab piece of this for me is, is, is very important. And just to move forward into the sort of education piece, um, what we need to do is, is capture this content to improve the, that decision-making process, but equally how we can use that for, for the education and built environment professionals of, of the future. And that's where the, the, the NMITE role that I've taken on comes into play and the opportunity that presents itself through that, because NMITE is a startup higher education institute, so at, at present it doesn't have all the, the internal bureaucracy uh, and administration processes of a traditional university. So that offers, offers up an opportunity to, to do something and create something different in terms of that educational approach. And therefore, uh, present timber as something that is squarely in the, the 22nd century, uh, you know, in terms of a new model of, of educational delivery. So not about lectures, but about challenge-based learning. And indeed, ideally, those learners have been part of actual delivery of live projects, which is a lot of the work that we've done in the past through the likes of the, the built environment exchange process. And look at how we can create an educational system which, you know, at its heart will still have to have the, the, rel the relevant levels of quality assurance, et cetera, associated with it. But fundamentally, it becomes an educational system, so it's consistently up updated and refreshed through uh, live projects, et, et cetera. Um, so in that regard, we have, we've done some work uh, in, in terms of creating a, a competency framework to respond to this in terms of what does the, uh, what do the, what does the educational requirements of the sector uh, and, and of course, that has a lot more granulation to it, which we don't have time to go through. And then the Cat Living Lab building, which is going up in, in Hereford, will be part of the, the Living Lab approach. And ideally, in the future, we can get to position where these timbers, where these buildings are, are manufactured through uh, a fully timber-based approach also. So with that, I'll thank you very much for your time. Uh, and we'll hand over for Q&A, I'm sure. <laughs>